So welcome to this week's charting analysis webinar. My name is Jasper Lawler, market analyst here at CNC Markets. I'm going to first take you through the, uh, the risk warning on the screen here. Any questions at any time, please just send them through the chat or Q&A box. Open to discussing any topic. And indeed, uh, any market, any sort of chart, chart formation, I'll certainly have opinion at least. So certainly feel free to, to get involved. Nonetheless, I'll be traveling through the, uh, the major products that our clients tend to focus on. So that's uh, some of the major indices, commodities, and FX pairs, and uh, just some of the main drivers for, uh, for what's going on this week. So the big event, as you probably all know this week, is uh, given that it's the first week of the month, is uh, it's the non-farm payrolls on Friday. It's the most important non-farm payrolls since the last one. I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but um, you know we are supposedly approaching a time when the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve in the U.S. is looking to raise interest rates, and so you know, this is the major data point on the U.S. economic calendar. So of course we're going to focus on it. Um, but there are some other um, interesting events going on this week um, for those trading the British pound, to some degree the UK 100. We've got the Bank of England uh, setting rates on uh, what's deemed Super Thursday. It's super because not only do they set the rates, they also release the minutes at the same time, which they've been doing at every meeting now. And uh, on this event, they also release their um, growth and inflation forecasts. So if I um, quickly skim through some of the other things to look out for this week, today we've had a lot of PMI manufacturing data. The general theme has been, and partly explains why European markets are higher today, although slightly just edging it, is that um, there was a, a general improvement in, in Europe and uh, a massive improvement in UK manufacturing, um, according to the final numbers for October. So that was surprising, because obviously we're all focusing on a slowdown in China. The Chinese numbers were slightly improved, not fantastic. There's a sort of uh, there's the official one. There's a couple of private ones mixed together. It was all a bit sort of unchanged, which uh, probably better than sharp declines. So actually, you know, those the kind of global slowdown fears that have been driving part of the reason for the the slide that we saw in, in August, they're coming off the table a bit. So another reason to suggest that this um, this recent rally in in equities has been justified. And we'll look at some of these major indices that have been doing that. Uh, we've got the RBA uh, rate decision um, sort of early hours tomorrow. Uh, we've got uh, Draghi speaking uh, speaking tomorrow in Frankfurt. We've got um, some more PMIs on on Wednesday, and of course the uh, ISM non uh, manufacturing is on Wednesday. Worth mentioning that we still got the ISM manufacturing for today. Um, Yellen speaking on Wednesday, uh, but not expected to be um, too much in regard to monetary policy. Uh, we've got the BOE rate decision on, uh, on Thursday, and um, then on, on Friday we've obviously got the, the non-farm payrolls report. So the general consensus is 180,000 jobs created on the NFP. You know, so you know, broad sort of um, way to approach this if you are trading the event is just, um, you know, uh, either you have some opinion as to whether 180 is over or undervalued. I would suggest that's a risky approach. Um, you know, these economists often get it pretty wrong. Um, so to some extent, maybe you, you know, you're, you're, you know, if you are placing a trade before the event, you're just making a judgment on how wrong the economist estimates are, rather than doing the trickier job that the economists have of actually pinpointing exactly how many jobs are created. So to some extent, your job's a little bit easier there. Or you can take the approach of waiting for the number to come out, judge how much variance there is between the actual number and the consensus forecast number, and uh, make a trade based on that. You have to be a bit quick to catch that initial momentum. Sometimes it gaps away. The other approach is to judge how far the market moves um, and judge whether that was justified based on the change. 
between the actual and uh, forecast number and actually fade the initial move back, maybe back towards where the market started before the news release. So, you know, with all that uh, data in mind, let's, uh, let's compare to, um, to equity. So worth mentioning that for the UK 100, or the FTSE 100 rather, it was the, uh, the best month since 2013 last month. So it was a good one, and you can see, uh, you know, right from the beginning of October, we rallied up here. We kind of sideways stalled a little bit towards the end. Uh, the FTSE, I would say, underperformed some of the European and U.S. indices towards the end of the month. Nonetheless, that, uh, that you know, the first part of the month carried it into being one of the best months in a while. And at the moment, you, know, you can see in the chart forum here that I've just said that it's. Um, it's dipped below this little rising trend line. There's only two connecting points on there. It's not the strongest level, but something to bear in mind, a sort of a bearish bias toward perhaps the bottom of this, this sideways range that we've been in, which you can see has pretty much been between the 50% fib of this decline since April and the 38.2. That's kind of where the range has been. Obviously, we've had a false break out above. We've had a false break below, um, but that's kind of what's um, securing it. So if we do get a dip into this um, this zone, it's been tested one, two, arguably three times before, but nonetheless quite strong support here. And I would say this is you know the kind of pivotal level here. If we do do if we do drop below this, I would say around six two sixty. Um, given that we've had some RSI bearish divergence here, we've failed at the fifty several times. A drop through there, to my mind, takes us back down to five nine hundred. Would be the next major support. Worth calling out quickly, just to bear in mind where we generally are. We had a sharp decline there, you know, in um, uh, from April through through August, and we're just in kind of catch up mode. But you can see we've not made up. You know, that's what this fifty percent means is that we've only made up half the ground of the decline. So even though it was a strong month last uh, last month, um, still got a fair bit to do. Um, so in terms of a quick, quick summary uh, for, you, for everyone trading the UK 100, we're trapped in a range. Um, so the choice is buying at the bottom of the range, selling at the top of the range, or waiting for a breakout, one of those two. Um, but I think because we have been consolidating for a while, of course you can get false breaks, but um, talking about the, the genuine break that happens, I think could carry us quite, quite strongly. Potentially some resistance above from that former trend line and 61.8% and retracement on a higher breakout, plus that 200 day. So, you know, several layers of resistance above, down not so much. And um, so, some interesting potential breakout trades here. Let's skip across to the, uh, the Germany 30. Here I've zoomed down to a lower time frame. So this is the uh, the three hour chart. Now it obviously looks more dramatic than the the daily chart we were just looking at, but nonetheless, the Germany 30 has outperformed the UK 100 at least in those last few weeks where the UK was going kind of sideways. Um, Germany was um, was was powering forward, and um, I mentioned in the uh, previous week's webinar that we have a a double bottom that's been confirmed here. So the the objective for that double bottom pattern would be the 100% of this height of the pattern would be up here at this uh, 11,750 kind of area, which corresponds to this potential zone of resistance from these peaks uh, back in August, July, and June. And so, this is characteristics of a, of a characteristic of a uh, bull flag pattern. You know, a strong kind of pole to the flag here. And then this is the, the kind of rough kind of flag area. And we've had a, a big move up today, and we're kind of pushing up above, um, la, you know, last week's high. And so technically a breakout taking place at the moment. Um, not We've not had a close for the day above, so um, yes, some caution to be had still, but um, an intraday breakout of the high. Mm -hmm. 
to my mind, the uh, the trend in the short term is 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 um, is higher. You know, so we've got a um, bullish breakout within a high, within an uptrend. But of course, we're below that 200-day moving average. People are going to be a bit cautious, and we do have that um, that low, which I've highlighted on the chart from July 27th, uh, which could scupper the breakout. Um, Nonetheless, keep in mind that that's the eventual objective, but that's not to say it can't uh, drop even below the bottom of this flag before eventually reaching that, reaching that target. So um, try not to confuse a, you know, a little short-term pattern like this flag with uh, the longer-term objective, because just because you may get there, it may get to this 11,750, but it's not to say it can't chop around a lot in the meantime and uh, false break a lot of uh, short-term bullish patterns. US 30, our proxy for the, the Dow Jones. Now I mentioned here in the uh, the chart forum, we've got a bit of an unconvincing looking bearish engulfing pattern here. So technically, they the whole day of Friday engulfed the whole day of Thursday, but Thursday was a very low range day and Friday was fairly low range. Um, so a little false break, then a bearish. So you know they, that is generally quite a, a decent pattern where you see the false break of the high and then it closes below the previous day's low. That you know, that is a, a nice pattern to trade, but we are in a strong uptrend and that was not a you know a massively convincing bearish day. And I suspect we could get another little push higher, potentially break the higher then be just be aware if we get a false break um, in the next few days of that peak from Friday, that could be a more conclusive um uh, bearish pattern because um, we know we'll have pulled in the one peak and then we'll have gone up and do like a little mini double top so the sort of thing that you can probably see a little bit better on say the four hour chart um, if we get, if we come up here again fail it here or fail just above maybe at the 7900 level 17900 then come lower that would be something probably a bit more conclusive to suggest this uh, this trend's running out of steam but uh, you know, a few things to keep in mind here. This peak from July 31st and this declining trend line, two reasons to suggest the market could peter out here. But on the bullish side, we've made it convincingly above that. You know, we peaked above the 200-day moving out, pushed off it, correcting a little bit from this resistance here. But um, so far, trend is up, and the bias has got to be for a, a push probably into the 18,000 level. Should we not get that um, that false break of that high that I mentioned? Uh, so that's equities. You know, certainly feel free to let me know if there's some other indices you wanted to cover. I'll quickly show you just the, the, the NASDAQ because that's been one of the strongest. You can see that we're literally at uh, the highs on the, on the NASDAQ, which is um, I mean, pretty crazy given the, um, the decline that we've seen in, um, in Apple stock when everyone's really worried about the, the U.S. tech sector. You know, the tech sector has carried U.S. stocks higher again. And this 4816. That's, that would be a record high for the NASDAQ 100, which, uh, you know, we, uh, we could conceivably see this week. Um, I believe we have Facebook earnings this week. So that would, um, you know, that would be a pos possible catalyst of pushing the, UK, uh, the U.S. NASDAQ 100 um, up into that 4,800 vicinity, assuming that Facebook puts in some good results. They have been recently. So I'm not going to go into too much depth here. Double bottom, uh, double top. Sorry, if it fails, you know, obviously that wouldn't be confirmed until a sort of breakout of one of these these lows. Uh, that pattern wouldn't be completed until down here, but still, um, you know, an early entry in would be on a, some sort of bearish candlestick uh, on the weekly or daily chart in around here. Again, a bit like the Dow, a bearish engulfing candle here, but you know that to me is probably going to be catching more people out thinking that that's you know people are going to be tempted to go in short there but that, you know this is still a strongly bullish market uh, I would be more hesitant so it was quite a big week for central banks last week and it is again this week particularly if you're trading the pound so let's jump into the pound against the dollar 
Now, I think the thing to focus on overall is that we're in this range. We're in this 151 to 158 slash 59 range. Um, and so let that bias all your decisions, just to know that the trends are not going to, you know, trends into these this low area aren't likely to last too long. And say like this trend that began here, you know, saw a, a big, uh, it was sort of sort of false break of this declining line, and price came all the way down here. It's, just, it's a range bound market, so these trends are not um, uh, not continuing as, as as fast as you you know might hope in a sort of environment where we're putting consistently higher highs and higher lows in or lower highs and lower lows. You know, it's a range. And so, um, you know, say like last week, you know, we saw a bounce off that trend line, we saw a dip down to this low. Now, you know, you know this was, this channel here to me was a sign that we were drifting back into this low was when we finally just broke below this previous peak and weren't able to bounce and push back through the trend line again. That was probably the first sign where we had the false break through the trend line and then this was the confirmation once we finally broke through that peak. That was telling us that we're not in strong bull mode. That was telling us that we're still in choppy sideways or orange mode. And so, but then we did, you know, we got down to these two candles um, open and close, uh, found support again, corresponding with this rising RSI trend line. And so I did have a RSI line like this, false break to the top side, back down in again, and then, so the, you know, that didn't turn out to be the greatest of lines, um, a few false whipsaws around there. The next one is just the horizontal line through these two peaks, um, which I think probably a few people will be more, you know, will no, be noticing. It's around the 65 level. So after having been oversold, twice, a push through 65 would take us out of the uh, bearish mode to the market and um, push us back into sideways mode and then should we get overbought again, then my bias would be turning a bit more bullish and expecting a push back to the top of the range around 158. As far as the, um, the details of the Bank of England, most um, the sort of joke that's being thrown around at the moment is there's not going to be any fireworks. Um, from the Bank of England, it's, it's bonfire night, obviously, uh, on Thursday. Um, the, uh, the expectation is that the voting is going to remain eight to one, and probably they're going to ease off on their growth and inflation forecast, which would be um, probably on the whole a bit bearish for the pound. That would obviously be thrown off a bit should we see a, um, a change in the voting. There's a risk that it could go to seven to two. That would be if Kristen Forbes got involved. Um, she's orientating a bit towards the, uh, the hawkish side <clears throat> uh, in the belief of a, a rate rise. Um, but still, it's, you know, that would be a slight shock um, and could tilt. Um, could tilt us towards a breakout of these technical levels that we're talking about in the pound, but otherwise I think it's probably going to be fairly dovish as the expectation. We could just have a quick look at Euro, Euro sterling for, for those who are interested. Similar situation really, um, just we've got to bear in mind that we're in this horizontal range. It looked like we could be um, set for a breakout, uh, but once we failed here, that was the first sign of failure at the old peak. And then the next time was the break of this rising trend line. And then we had a nice follow through down there. And I've subsequently broken these two potential levels of support as well. So pretty bearish. The default was for a drift back into this um, this um, area of uh, sort of support zone here at the bottom of this range. Let's take a look at the euro. Obviously, it tanked pretty severely after the uh, the ECB meeting with the um, with the surprise surprisingly strong hints at uh, further easing at the December meeting. So, as I mentioned in the the chart forum here, 111 is pretty key uh, because it is a confluence of potential resistance from that um, you know, from these two lows uh, from September. And uh, we saw a bounce off it, uh, you know, break of it, a little retest, a drop down. Now we're looking at a second retest. So if we can close above it, then actually maybe the focus of the market is more 
this horizontal range you know caps down here um, and, and, and resistance up above here more than this triangle pattern. But if we do see us, uh, the market fall away from this vicinity, then that's a, a break, retest, break, not a retest, failure. Again, is a pretty bearish sign, and I think we could roll over, essentially break the 108 low and head down into uh, the bottom of a range characterized by these two lows uh, back in March and April. So watch out for a, um, a close above or below 111 in the next few days. To, me, to my mind, that's going to be key. Uh, as I mentioned, Draghi speaking tomorrow could be could well be a catalyst. He was talking over the weekend, a bit of a um, bit of a step back from the very dovish uh, ECB meeting, saying that um, the, the, the ECB is open to more. Um, to more stimulus, so um, you know maybe not as affirmative as perhaps the meeting suggested that December is definitely happening. Um, we've seen inflation tick higher since the, the ECB meeting, so in the next report for CPI, which will be in about a month's time, should that see inflation above zero again? Um, then maybe there's no action from the ECB whatsoever, or maybe they just sort of decide to, to cut the deposit rate or something which was hinted at a bit in this meeting, um, saying that uh, they actually did discuss cutting the deposit rate, so the the, uh, the interest rates are not at a lower bound, as previously stated by um, President Draghi. And so that would, to my mind, would be a slightly, you know, would obviously be further reasoning, but not be quite as exciting to the market as an expansion of QE um, to perhaps 80 million euros a month purchases or just extending the timeline perhaps indefinitely. Both of those would be pretty euro dovish, uh, euro bearish. Cut to the deposit rate may be a bit of a disappointment. And um, that could be the trigger for us getting back above 112. Dollar yen, you know, what can you say? We're just still in this range. Uh, last week we failed twice to get through the 121.50 slash 122 kind of resistance area. And uh, we're still in this range trading environment. And my default assumption is that we're drifting back down to 119 and possibly 118 from here. Um, can't really say much else until we're outside of this range. So love and life if you're in this, uh, you know, if you're a range trader, um, kind of a, you know, the aggressive way to play this is selling at 121 and buying at 119. Would have worked lots of times um, in the past few months, but obviously it can't uh, it can't work forever. At some point we're going to get a breakout, but it's it's not too obvious which way at this stage. Um, you know, one of the one of the reasons is that last week we had the, the Bank of Japan. There was a bit of expectation that they might actually add extra stimulus. They didn't, and so now a lot of people kind of giving hope on that respect. Um, and so if the BOJ is not doing more, especially in the light of China and Europe doing more, um, and particularly if the Fed holds off a rate rise in December, you know, the momentum will be judged as shifting away from the Bank of Japan easing, and we could see the, um, the dollar weaken and the euro weaken and the pound weaken perhaps against the yen. Now let's switch over to commodities. Gold obviously being one of the most sort of sensitive to the, the Federal Reserve. Now it's no surprise really we saw this breakout uh, when it looked, uh, you know, after the September meeting and uh, it just looked like, um, you know, rate rise this year was completely off the table. That was shattered last week somewhat. Um, and this was Wednesday when the, the Fed said in their latest October meeting um, when they suggested through the statement that a December rate rise is still on the table. You saw gold rising in anticipation of a dovish statement um, and severely disappointed. I think it was about a sort of $40 odd, $35 maybe, uh, round trip for gold. Um, pretty bearish day and we've, we've headed south in the three days since. A little bit of interim support I would suggest here from this 8th of October low, um, but there was only one 
uh, one day to the left that was higher the, the previous day below that was actually had a you know had a lower day so not a particularly strong support to my mind I like to see lows defined by two higher closes on either side of the low to characterize it as a significant swing point uh, so, so not the case here nonetheless um, I haven't actually checked the FIBO level, I don't think it's as relevant given that we're in a fairly sort of sideways market, but might have a bit of confluence from the, um, there you go, yeah, it sort of looks like it, the 61.8% FIB level got a bit of confluence from that low. So those two together could be the recipe for a little bit of a bounce in gold here, uh, but I'm still suspecting that even if we get a little bounce, maybe back to that um, broken potential uh, support zone from these two peaks. Um, we eventually, to my mind, probably head down to the bottom of this rising channel. And, um, you know, that uh, I think any def decisive change in, in gold probably um, is going to have to wait really for that December Fed meeting. If the, uh, the non-farm payrolls on Friday is, is strong, that's probably gold down to the bottom of the channel here, perhaps even down to the 1105 low. Um, weaker than expected report, you know, but that may be the catalyst for gold to, um, to push back into the uh, range again, maybe even back above the 200 day. Didn't mention actually that with the, um, the, the Fed, obviously we've got the headline number, um, which is 180,000 jobs expected, but almost more important than that is the, the wage growth. That's been flat for the last couple of months. <clears throat> and so, um, People are really looking for signs um, that the uh, that, that slack, as they like to call it, is is coming out of the labour market. That labour market conditions are tightening, and this weak wage growth is just a sign that there's still some slack in there. And it kind of raises a question over how indicative, you know, how much, you know, how good of a useful indicator is the unemployment rate at 5.1%? You know, is that really telling us the true picture about the labour market if there's no wage growth and the part participation rate, i.e. how many people in the economy are, or uh, the people eligible to work, how many of those are actually attempting to get jobs, um, it's at multi-decade low, lows at the moment. So those two things are sort of weighing on, on you know, otherwise 5% unemployment, great, you know, should have raised rates ages ago, I think probably should nonetheless, but still a couple of reasons there with those other indicators suggest that things are not quite as rosy as they suggest. So watch out for that average, average hourly earnings number. Even if we get a miss and 180K comes in perhaps at 170 or something, you know, if we see wage growth, that overall could be taken as a, um, a bullish sign for the Fed meeting in December, uh, a hawkish sign rather. Now let's look at silver. This is um, this has certainly been tricky recently. <laughs> I've been trying to trade a few RSI signals here to, to little avail. <clears throat> so what we've had is we've had uh, just to take you back um, is we had some uh, negative divergence there. You know, so that was a, eventually worked out. But needless to say, we had a um, you know this this trend line as it turned out worked out pretty well. But if you if you you know if you'd sold here based on this you know higher high in the price higher low in the RSI and if you sold down in in one of these candles you know you were probably stopped out above that old high and then uh, there was also a um, <clears throat> slightly less commonly used um, RSI indication where there was a lower low in RSI yet a higher high in price. So as I mentioned down here, that's a RSI positive reversal. That that worked, but immediately reversed into a um, bearish candlestick and took us below that um, was sort of a rising trend line there. So all sorts of chop taking place in silver. Definitely tricky to trade right now. Um, and right now we're heading into this sort of 40 zone. So, so from having been um, overbought at this point, we're now into the stages where, you know, this is kind of our last, last stretch.
posturing of telling us we're in a bullish market before we kind of give up hope below this 40 level. And that's our kind of bullish zone in RSI is, is above 40 after having been over, overbought. So bit, a bit similar to gold, obviously, um, in that we've got this, this uh, support here, which it's stronger than the gold support, which is what we're coming off at the moment, is this um, October 8th low. But my suspicion, again, is that we probably do break this 40 level and come and test this uh, dec uh, declining trend line. Uh, slash this peak from December 25th. And uh, finally, I think it was Brent that I looked at on the crude oil front, just because I thought that that sort of nicely defined where we were. False break below the um, RSI support, held nicely onto the, uh, the the lowest point in the last few months, the 15th, 15th of September low. Got a little uh, hammer off there, and then a nice break out to the top side the following day. So, you know, if you'd send that hammer off the low, Put a little buy stop. You know, obviously, the benefit of hindsight, we know it's worked. But just, you know, just as a little reference, this did work quite well. Had you done something along these lines, a little buy stop above there, uh, or even a market order, when we saw that breakout, took us nicely up to this previous range resistance, just sort of this previous peak from here on the 16th of, of Oct. So um, we're, we're basically back into range trading conditions. Um, I would, you know, we're coming off the 50 psychological level at the moment. My assumption is that we probably push back through it and remain in, in, in range-bound conditions. Fundamentals for oil are not good, but they're not significantly worse than they have been in the past few months. Um, U.S. oil inventories, um, you know, they're, they're going through a kind of stage of um, building at the moment. So more barrels of oil left over. Um, demand not quite meeting supply, but it's it's been fairly cyclical, and we'll probably I wouldn't be surprised to see that changing in the next week or so to a few drawdowns. So not much I would say to be drawn uh, conclusions to be drawn from that in terms of which way we finally break out at this range. Uh, so that's it. That's uh, that's the major markets covered for this week. I hope that was useful. Um, keep in mind, obviously, we've got the uh, the FOMC this week. Um, we've still got ISM manufacturing later today on Monday. Um, we've got the ADP report Wednesday. We've got the Bank of England Thursday. Um, so it's a lot going on. So good luck with trading this week. Thanks a lot for your time. Jasper Lord signing out.